Welcome to The Hollywood Reporter Presents. I am here with the talent behind The Falcon and The Winter Soldier. Welcome, everyone. How's it going? How's it going? How are we going? Fantastic. (laughs) So first off, I want to congratulate you guys on a fantastic uh, series. I really think that it is a highlight of superhero storytelling. You guys all did an amazing job. Thank Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, it's been about a month since the, the finale uh anthony how's it feel to be captain america it's uh it's 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 great it's actually uh it's been interesting seeing people's reactions um the way uh kids have responded um just the all-around uh adventure of being captain america has been a um has, has been much more pleasant than i thought it would be Sebastian, you have been uh, in the MCU for about 10 years now, so you've got a little bit of seniority here. Uh, what is it about Bucky Barnes that you know allows you to keep the character feeling fresh to explore new avenues? Oh, it, it, it's always been a blessing, you know, coming back around and and um, I don't know, it, every time it feels like we're finding something new and as long as we can do that, then, then that's great, you know? I have to ask, uh, did it feel good to, to lose the long hair or do you miss it at all? Uh, yes, because wigs <laughs> are always a, a, a terrifying prospect, you know. And um, look, you know, you got to work. You got to go to work with Anthony. So anytime that <laughs> that you're saving, you know, any kind of feedback, we're, we're good. <laughs> <laughs> he was definitely hitting me on those wigs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Carl, how's it going? Well, how are you doing, man? I'm good. So uh, for a lot of people in my generation, you were the first uh, Black superhero seen on screen. I remember you back in Mantis in the 90s and uh, also as uh, the voice of Martian Manhunter uh, in Justice League. So I'm curious, you know, now that you're stepping into the shoes of Isaiah Bradley, did those past experiences kind of inform your choices there at all? Um, add a certain, you know, weight. I think that, you know, it, it, a lot of audiences, you know, felt a certain believability in terms of every word you said, just in terms of being able to connect you to those past characters. I, I think each time I participate in these universes, I, you know, I can only bring myself. And so, you know, having been, um, Having been in the other forms doesn't necessarily make a difference, but it is exactly the same because I'm I'm the only material I have. Um, yeah, Wyatt, how's it going? Good, how are you? Pretty good. So uh, you're a newcomer in, in the MCU. Uh, what's that experience been like for you? I know that you know John Walker has created quite a bit of stir online. Uh, audiences. They, they love to hate him. Uh, you've definitely made an impact in the characterization. So I'm curious about how the experience of stepping into a comic book character has been for you. It was great. I, I, um, I think it was always approached from a place of it's, you know, it's not a comic book character because that can sometimes come with a connotation of things that I felt, we, I think I was explained to when we first started that this wasn't necessarily going to to take that route, which I think it succeeded in doing it, brought a comic book to life in a way that was a little bit more reality based. And so I approached it just like a normal character that you ever would would approach anything with and um, didn't put too much pressure on the fact that it was, you know, Marvel or a big deal or, or whatever. Um, and uh, I think that helped, you know. I, uh, I believe that you might be the first uh, second generation MCU actor. Uh, did you, did you yeah. talk to your dad at all a little bit about the, the Marvel experience? Um, <clears throat> not, you know, everything's so different in that, that series, or what, uh, that series uh, volume, whatever, is much different than this was. So there were no specific questions about how it was done, but more so. He was just like, make sure you can go to the bathroom because everybody's got to wear a suit, you know, that is difficult to go to the bathroom in. And, and, and that was like legitimately the one piece of kind of advice was like, make sure you can go to the bathroom and you don't overeat. And that, that was it. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Kari, how are you? 
Great, great, great. Thank you. So um, I'm always curious, you know, about the, the experience of uh, Marvel directors, you know, the, you're working in a world that's already been so firmly established, you know, people have certain ideas and expectations about the MCU, you know, what was that like in terms of, you know, fitting into that world, but also bringing your own style? Uh, well, I think the first um, anecdote I have to say is that Malcolm and I went to the um, premiere of Endgame to see, you know, what the prequel was to our show. And the two at the end of it, the two of us looked at each other, and she was like, "I think that was the first wave of t sheer terror." <laughs> we were like, "Oh my God, what have we signed up for?" Um, uh, you know, it was great because it, it is so different. Uh, it is a very grounded show, and um, uh, it was in my sweet spot, and I think Malcolm's sweet spot. So uh, we were able to um, really imagine a, a location based. We were not as you know as typical. Um, otherworldly we were very grounded in our world so that made it a lot um, more not just relatable but um, uh, it, it came with its complications as a result because of course you are taking it you're doing a road trip as compared to um, you know what is otherworldly and which is built in a studio perhaps but um, so uh, I, I would say that to answer your question on the one hand it was kind of terrifying and on the other hand it was it, I was very much in my comfort zone um, and uh, really enjoyed every step of it. Can't tell you how much uh, I, I feel very melancholy that it's all over now. Malcolm, how are you doing? Mr. Newby, how you doing, man? Pretty good. Uh, so, you know, over the, over the course of the season, uh, you've talked a lot about the, the racial implications of the series uh, and the themes. But, you know, for me, one of the things that I really appreciated about The Falcon and the Winter Soldier is that I feel that you know, the soul of the show is inherently Black, right? In terms of the dialogue and the references that are being made, you know, from, you know, Sam referencing his TT to his sister Sarah making hot plates to, you know, Bucky being invited to the cookout at the end, you know, all of that just felt really authentic. Um, so, you know, I, I'm curious about the process of you, you know, as a writer, working in the writer's room, you know, how much of that came just naturally from the writers and how much of it was, you know, you kind of going back and forth with the actors and making sure that everything kind of came across the way you wanted it to. It, I, I think it was both. Um, um, it was definitely deliberate. And I remember early on, I don't know if Anthony remembers this, but like there was a moment, or I think even before we, way before we'd even gotten, it was probably the first generation of scripts where because of how he portrayed Falcon, right? Um, and we knew that like, he, that there was gonna be some more shading just to fit in with the greater, greater whole. There were conversations with Anthony. That's how eventually we ended up, you know, coming to the, get the group of us creatives came to the conclusion of attaching his real backstory to the character. So that would feel intuitive, but also in the room I, I've found in several writers' rooms, once you get a critical mass of Black writers, that natural grasp of pop culture and culture culture, it, it just fires and connects. It connects very easy. That's how you get like throwaway lines when um, Isaiah is like, now you ain't no Malcolm or Mark, you know, Mark or Mark Mandela, right? Like all that stuff it just rolls out, you know what I'm saying, once you get the get the right collective there. But it was definitely, it was definitely deliberate and we knew, we felt like it would give give this thing, it's the, the whole of it, its own personality. You know, well, one of the things that I really appreciate is that the series doesn't start with Sam simply, you know, accepting the mantle of Captain America. He really goes through the paces. Uh, he's challenged by the very concept of Captain America and America itself. Uh, and one of the things I kept coming back to during the season was uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s To America speech. And so I think it's really interesting that you have, you know, all of these different characters. You have Sam, uh, Bucky, Isaiah, John, who are all representing these different aspects of America. So, you know, I'm just kind of curious about the process of, you know, tracking these characters' arcs, um, you know, seeing them become who they become at the end of the season but also making sure that they still, you know, reflect a distinct aspect of America that isn't 
you know, necessarily wrong. They're all different from Steve's, but I don't think any character is necessarily coming from a, a, a wrong place. It's if I can jump in, like me, Kari, Nate, Zoe, the writers, I cannot tell you, it's literally months of work going into that. And like there's every single wall, we're in a giant room and every single wall is just to make the audience understand since I'm, so I'm not using jargon, imagine sort of uh, emotional and psychological timelines for the characters, everything, we all mapped everything out and banged on it endlessly. Anytime there's a change, what it meant to them, you know what I'm saying? Um, what felt honest, what felt authentic, you know what I'm saying? Our group worked really, really hard on that. I think also to add to that, um, every one of the um, actors involved, on the one hand knew their, well, you know, Anthony Sebastian knew their characters, but didn't know the depth of the character in terms they'd never gone home with them before. So they were able to bring on an awful lot to, um, to everything. And uh, Wyatt as well, Carl, we all talked about the characters and they, they added to what all the work that was done in the, in the pre-production, uh, we then added again, their voices and their thoughts and their ideas, which were always very smart and very insightful and um, made the characters, you know, really three dimensional, which is just part of the uh, wonderful creative process of collaboration when um, people, I mean, you know, John Walker was the least rendered character of all of them. And um, we, we ended up shooting sort of calibrated um, takes because we didn't know how funny he should be, how earnest he should be, how angry he should be. You know, we were still calibrating him for, for probably the first two months of shooting, if not longer. And Wyatt brought a lot to that and was able to, um, you know, just duck and dive as needed. Uh, because um, we were finding the character. So anyway, everybody really brought a lot to the table. You know, um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of uh, Mark Gruenwald's run on Captain America. And I think that there's a lot of, you know, thematic similarities in terms of what he did in the show and some of the characters he introduced or play a role in the show. Uh, so, you know, I'm curious of how much you guys, you know, went back and looked at some of those comics. I know that, you know, Anthony and Sebastian, you guys probably have your characters, you know, down pat by now, but for some of the, the, the newer characters, did you guys go back and reference some of those early appearances at all? Oh, you mean me? <laughs> yeah, you, you and Carl, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the, the, no, I, I didn't because I, I tried, I tried, you know, I tried to, to Google John Walker um, and see what came up. And what ended up happening was uh, I, did, I didn't understand how Marvel cinema, how, how the Marvel comic book universe worked, where it's not one thematic storyline that you're following. They branch off into like, hundreds of different storylines where there's iterations of the character that are totally different. Uh, so it was, it was, it got, it gets very confusing, very, very fast. Uh, and, and so I, I found myself not doing that, but referring to the artwork a lot <clears throat> because the artwork was there, it was the, it was similar. The body language was similar. Uh, just the way that, that they portrayed the, the, the body language of the guy gave me, a, a, I felt like a little bit more to work off of because it was almost more generalized, um, than, than the specific storyline. So that's the way I kind of used it to, 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 to thread the, the character. And again, we basically did what Kari said. It, it, you didn't know when it was, when humor was needed, when earnestness was needed, when anger was needed. It was, it was you know, you just didn't know. And so you, you, trusting in the team that they were gonna pick the right thing was, was uh, basically all I had to do. Carl, how about you? Did you uh, did you get a chance to look at uh, at Truth at all? Red, white, and uh, black. Um, no, I did not. I um, got uh, Cliff's notes version from my son, who okay. is conversant with all of the universes. Um, was in some ways a little upset because the DC universe and the Marvel universe um, are you know something that he wanted to compare, and for me, it's you know another gig. So. Um, I was concerned 
<laughs> with a loyalty to any, any particular. Carl, if I may, we win. <laughs> <laughs> but, hey, Carl, Carl, <laughs> tilt your camera down like a half an inch. My camera? Yeah, yeah. there it is. Tilt it. You got a flare. Tilt it down like a half inch. But then he's going to have to crunch. There it is. Oh. What? Wait. Oh. Whoa. Oh, I see. Another half inch. Yeah, yeah, move it closer. Move it closer and tilt it down a half inch. <laughs> no, you move back. Right there. Don't move. Carl. Oh, this is this. <laughs> yes. Anthony Maggie's directorial debut. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that the cameraman was always uh, complaining about how he was uh, relighting everything. You have a flare. It's coming from above <laughs> your head. <laughs> turn a, wait, turn a little bit to the right. Turn a little bit to the right. <laughs> that was this is the craziest Zoom of all time. <laughs> well, actually, and this is a metaphor for Isaiah, because Isaiah was removed from the world for 30 years. And, right. Um, so my, 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 um, my experience of Isaiah was I didn't know anything about him prior, except he was modeled in some ways, uh, from what I gathered, from the Tuskegee experiment, an experiment which involved sharecroppers who had um, syphilis not being told, not being treated, and kept in a study for 30 years. Yeah, so yeah. I think the similarities were such that um, that was the basis for how I felt um, and how I moved forward with Isaiah, a man who had a secret history, some of it incredibly painful, some of it incredibly brutal, but who triumphed and was living a quiet life with what he knew. Anthony, I think that, you know, the scenes that you share with Isaiah uh, are some of the most powerful in the series. Did it make you think about Sam Wilson, you know, in a different way that you had before? Absolutely not. I mean, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, I was, I couldn't be more, I, I had a lot of uh, fear about this show going into it. It was, it was one of the first things about Marvel that I've been a part of that I questioned and I re wasn't really sure that I actually wanted to do it. Um, and what Malcolm and Kari uh, were able to do with this character and with this show and actually with the Marvel universe um, has changed my entire perspective on what Sam can be. Uh, the, the, it shows how important it is to have a, a leader with direction and fearlessness. Um, so I always had a clear idea of what um, Sam was and who he was, but you know, Malcolm really crafted that into an actual um, person. And Kari, <laughs> at no point, stepped back and was like, "We're going too far." Like her, her, her her force and her ability to, to see the world and her heart actually led a lot to who uh, Sam is in this show. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's mind blowing when you think you know someone like Sam Wilson and two people who are amazing at what they do come along and craft and create this, this person into who he actually is. So that's, that's 100% to them and they, really introduced me to who Sam was, or, as opposed to the idea of who I thought he was. Malcolm, if you're not crying right now, I... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm serious. There were, there were many days when I read the script and when we were on set um, that I was really blown away. Kari, look, it's 2021. You're a sweet white lady from Canada. Every day on set, you were supposed to go, oh, I don't know, what do you think? But every day on set, I was saying, oh no, what do you think? And you were like, no, <laughs> we need to do more. And, and, and that's, I, I feel like that's indicative of, of where we are as a country and, and where we are as a people right now. And, you know, the reason we have Carl Lumley in this show is because of Malcolm. Like, 
you know, you hire Malcolm and he walk in a room and he's like, this what he gonna be. And they were like, I don't know, Malcolm. And he's like, no, kiss my ass. This what it's gonna be. <laughs> so it, it, you know, the, the strength and force of who you guys were, or were at that time and who you are now is really what this show is. So that needs to be acknowledged. Man, I, you, my you know what, uh, Malcolm? You and I are like the odd couple, are we not? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> um, I think, you know what? When I first went in to present, um, just you know, I knew nothing uh, about the show really because they give you when you go in to you know present your take on it, they you get one paragraph basically of what the show. So all I knew was it was the first black cap in America. And I came in and I said, you know, this is the most important show uh, of the century. And I believed that from the beginning. And so um, I was just thrilled that Malcolm said yes, uh, that he wanted me to be part of it. So anyway, thank you, Malcolm, officially. Hey, you guys, <laughs> it, 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 it is true that when, you know, now everyone's going to start fawning over each other. But it is true, <laughs> like, when you're seeing the dailies come back and the phone calls are coming in uh, from the Marvel execs and everything saying, oh my God, these actors, like it, it, it is one thing that was a trip about this experience is everybody, like every one of the cast for sure owned the roles. You, you know, there's no way you can take credit for the layers and personality uh, that they added to the roles, even the effects people, like when we were seeing, when Kari's sending us emails with the previs on the scenes and everything's clicking because you see them scenes and you're like, God damn, I thought I had an imagination. You know what I'm saying? And these people are masters. So um, it isn't just uh, whatever you call it. It's not just like, we're not going off a of script or whatever. Everyone was blown away by what everyone was doing. You know what I'm saying? And and that's not always on a production. And who's, who's the person sitting around saying, yo, Let's get the dude from Empire and the chick from The Handmaid's Tale. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and let's... Uh, let's have a lot to drink one night. <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's give them Anthony, Sebastian, Wyatt, and see what comes up. Like, nobody else, no one is doing that. No one. When they told me Kari was directing the show, I was like, oh, dope. They were like, yes, she did The Handmaid's Tale. I was like. <laughs> I, I, am I, what am, what am I missing? What, because I'm missing something. What am I missing? <laughs> I was like, I saw The Handmaid's Tale. Wasn't no brothers in that tale. So I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, this is, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry, I digress. Go ahead, Richard, my bad. No, 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 it's all good. <laughs> um, so, Malcolm, you know, you've talked a lot about truth being a major inspiration to the series. Uh, you know, I, I remember when that came out when I was a kid, and even then, I just knew that it was a significant story that was so different from what we'd seen before. I mean, like, that's how I learned about the Tuskegee experiments from that book. Um, and I think it's interesting how you incorporated it into, you know, this series, because Sam doesn't have a relationship with Isaiah in the comics. And in fact, you know, Isaiah doesn't even really have a, have a voice, you know, he's he's been mentally handicapped by the procedure. And I think that you giving him a voice is is so important because honestly, like we don't need any more, you know, voiceless black people in our in our media. So I'm just curious about how you incorporated those oh, yeah. changes and made them fit in so seamlessly uh, with the with the narrative that you have here. It, it, there was a little jousting with Kevin about it. You know what I'm saying? Because everyone, one thing the fans should know is even though the MCU veers off from the books you really do try and be respectful of them. You know what I'm saying? Because they, they got us here. Um, um, and they took big swings like truth. I remember that when that first came out too. And that shit felt like it was out of nowhere. You know what I'm saying? Like what made someone do that book? You know what I'm saying? Um, so you're right. Like uh, Isaiah, 
Isaiah is a vegetable basically in the comics and he doesn't have a relationship with Sam. At the same time, we were clear, you know, I definitely was on what that character would mean to Sam as he was going on this journey. And that's the magic of the translation from comic to MCU is there's all this almost preordained perfection. Once you allow the adjustments to happen, you feel like, oh, it was always meant to go this way. You know what I'm saying? Did I, should I say more? No, no. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Drop the mic. <laughs> you know, uh, so one of the other things that I, I, you know, thought was really interesting is, you know, obviously there is a comparison between Sam and John Walker in terms of, you know, how they perform the role of Captain America. But I also think it's really interesting to look at uh, John Walker and Bucky, you know, as these two characters dealing with PTSD uh, and kind of, you know, navigating the fact that, you know, these countries have, these organizations have, have used them as weapons in a way. Um, and, you know, how, how it's helped and also hindered their ability to kind of function uh, in the world. So I'm, I'm curious about getting into, you know, that headspace of dealing with, you know, that trauma uh, exploring that through through therapy in Bucky's case and in John's case, he probably needs a little bit of therapy. But you know kind of how he kind of carries that baggage. I, you got. You in therapy. Okay. The therapy is always a good thing for anybody. <laughs> even if you don't have anger issues, even if you haven't been to war, therapy is good. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but, but like for John, uh, it was something that I think we t we talked about. Um, before we started that uh, the, the, the Medal of Honor for us as civilians is something we look at and say, well, he must have done something great or she must have done something great to be awarded the Medal of Honor. And uh, <clears throat> there was a podcast that I listened to, um, this is Jocko Williams podcast uh, with, I can't remember, I can't remember his, the, the, the guy's name. Um, I should I should remember his name. Uh, he he explained basically the entire day that led to him being given the Medal of Honor, and it was so horrific and it was so awful that it made me think. God, every time that he looks at that thing, it reminds him of that day. It doesn't remind him of how great of a person he is. It reminds him of how how many friends he died and how how much went wrong. So in John's case. Um, I was able to use that to be to uh, inform the character a little bit in terms of you think what he's doing is going out and trying to be Captain America and bluster and and he's and he's and he's so qualified and all of this stuff, but inside he's like the rest of us who has a little bit of imposter syndrome. He he's trying to be someone that he he's not. He's not comfortable being thrown into this position. He's never thought about the implications of these things. He's only ever thought about wanting the result of something and not necessarily looking at his journey as what's going to be the thing that teaches him the most in life. So, you know, he's at the beginning of that, but for, for John, that's sort of, I think the inception of it, when we kind of found that little nugget and it helped, helped out a lot. And uh, Sebastian for, for Bucky, you know, I think that he's really coming on the other side of, of that trauma in this series, you know, he's finding himself again um, you know, and, and you've played Bucky for a while. So what was it like to, to tap into this, you know, I guess, new area of, of his mind? No, it was exciting. I mean, like we were, we were trying to figure out how to like take the character in a new way, you know, and, and there was a balance to that. And I think we found it finally. Um, and, and it was a collaborative process all through the end. Um, but but yes, in the sense of like getting him to a place where he can accept certain things and, um, you know, have, ha having felt like he's evolved in some way, I think was the goal. And I thought we did that pretty well. But I should mention is extraordinary. We shot the ending. Yeah, early. Yeah. And, and it somehow stuck, right? We got, we got that be those beautiful scenes of you guys together. And then we kind of, so we kind of knew where we were heading, weirdly. Maybe it was a good thing, you yeah. know, like just yeah. in the sense of like, 
how 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 warm and awesome that that experience was on the on, on those docks like we had a good time like that was a good time and and we got that in the first week you know so at least we knew where we were going at least for 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 this character you know um i thought that was really helpful it definitely set the tone um yeah you know it's it was when i when i first went out to the dock I dreaded it because I know what it's like to be on a dock at sunrise. <laughs> you have mats, you have wind, you, it's, it's, and literally I covered myself in deep. It was, it was a disaster of a morning. And once we got everybody out there, it, it just felt like you were like in Southern Louisiana on a dock buying seafood from some people who had just came back on the boat. Like it was, it was really just, it was a, it was, it was a beautiful camaraderie to start the show because, you know, after that, everything went, to but that <laughs> was. What do you mean the earthquake or the pandemic? Which one? <laughs> day one, day one. Day one. I, I remember a, the AD coming up to me and going, Kari wants to catch the sunrise, and 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 going like we got to get out, we we got to get out there and get the sunrise on that water, you know, like. <laughs> I know you were the first shot. That shot of you walking first across. Shot was, and I, he's like, "What?" I said, "Yank him out of makeup. Come on, let's go, 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 go." <laughs> like, oh my now this is gonna go. <laughs> but it was a beautiful, beautiful beginning to the whole thing, and the end shot of the two of you kind of walking off into the into the party of it was uh, just one of those serendipitous moments where we grabbed it. And I, we didn't have a sort of an end moment planned at that point. And I, there was the sun and there were the two guys and we had the equipment and a crew and a dock and a thing. And I went, well, let's just grab this and see. And um, it never ever shifted from day one of, you know, looking at the edits and such, it never wasn't the end shot. So there was something serendipitous about the whole thing. Awesome. Well, I think that's a, that's a good point to, to end on. Uh, I really appreciate you guys taking the time to, to chat with me today. Uh, take the time out of your busy schedules for this. Uh, so it was great talking to you all. Again, I, I love the show. Uh, I'm looking forward to what comes next. Terrific. Thank, Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.